land or a settlement down at the mouth of the Mississippi on the, on, on, on the Gulf. At that time, they would start using the rivers to come westward. Uh, the Red River, the Platte River, the Arkansas, the Upper Missouri. As the French are moving westward up the main watersheds, rumors started coming into Santa Fe. Now Santa Fe and Mexico proper were mining literally hundreds of thousands of pounds of silver. They didn't have dynamite. These were all ground mines where you could take a pocket knife and peel it back like cheese. They're starting the peso, which would put the first economy, world economy, on record using the silver peso. You could go to Harvard on a Spanish dollar. America's first congressional money was backed by the Spanish dollar. And everybody knew it, especially the French. And so let's just call Santa Fe the Constantinople. It was the thermometer of danger that threatened the Spanish Empire. As early as 1695, we, there was a big a trade center in Taos, just a little bit north of Santa Fe. Uh, Navajos had come in and they'd been pounded by the French and Pawnee. They came in three years later, 1698, and uh, had, were wearing French trade coats and bringing in weapons. And they said the French are good fighters and they'll back you in a play and they're excellent shots. And so by 1719, the fervor and the danger inherent from French intrusions into the Spanish West via Santa Fe were at their height. The governor had gone out uh, from Santa Fe in 1719 on a punitive expedition and in the process didn't find anybody because he took such a group of people, it was even bigger than Coronado, uh, you could see them coming for miles. But anyhow, they ran across some Paloma Apaches which had been driven out of northern Colorado up on the Republican River in that area. And uh, they had met the French and uh, the big chiefs held up their shirts and their bodies had been laced by bullets and so forth and so on. And he said, uh, we can't hold our own against it. How about the Spanish coming to help us? And the governor was heading back. It was getting toward fall. He didn't want to get caught in the blizzard. He said, we'll see you next year, something of that nature, and split went south. But before he left these Paloma Apaches, one of them said, you know what? By the way, the French have built two towns the size of Taos up on the Platte River. So when the governor got back, he contacted the viceroy, which was the Hebrew authority in all of Mexico, and said, we're under attack. The year came 1720. France and Spain got into a fight on the continent and it upped the ante even more. So the governor was told by the viceroy to send a reconnaissance patrol to find the French. And they did. But they disappeared from history. In an attic in Switzerland in 1950, an amateur anthropologist was on climbing through this attic in a castle and pushed aside these rolled hides, and it turned out to be a painting 17 feet long by four and a half foot high. And it appeared to be Europeans and very serious uh, uh, American Indians in a full out conflict. About the same time in archives in Paris, France, they found a Spanish diary that had apparently been left on the battlefield and uh, it to contain 10 pages of writing up to and the night before the fight. And they put the two together and they said, ah, the lost recon uh, uh, of team. And what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna show you some of the images, but here's basically what took place. Uh, roughly 46 soldiers and some civilians back then, um, the presidios um, were often backed by civilian militia to fortify their position. And so roughly an expedition of 46 New Mexicans and the presidio soldiers came right out of the downtown Santa Fe and 60 in Indian auxiliaries go on this, this reconnaissance expedition. Um, they get up into the area where they think the French might be. And they cross uh, a, a, a small river, and uh, they cross the Platte River, and they will continue a little further and camp that night. Um, their scouts go out, 
down, down, uh, down the river about, about uh, six or ten miles, uh, they hear Indians. They can hear drums and so forth. So the scouts come back. And the, so the whole Spanish encampment moves down uh, a, across from a very large uh, Indian camp on the Platte River. At that time, they, the, the Spanish try to contact uh, the, 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 the Indian uh, using French. Uh, they had an interpreter with them. They had a young uh, Pawnee that had been uh, trained not to lose his language and sent him across the river. They would not let him, the uh, French, or th at this time the Pawnee would not let him return. Uh, there was a gentleman, real, real intriguing story. His name was Learcha Vecchi. Learcha Vecchi was one of the little Judases that uh, set up La Salle. La Salle uh, was murdered by his own men. And this, uh, uh, this uh, Archer Vecchi was a 12-year-old that kind of lined La Salle up, the French explorer, and had him killed with a headshot. Spanish found him, took him to Mexico. He came up through the ranks as a Presidio soldier. He developed a traitor. And at the time of this story, he had retired and was asked by the governor to participate as an interpreter for the expedition. So uh, Learcha Vecchi was writing notes and sending them across, and, and they were there for three days. But as a as the three days took place, they saw a diminishing reciprocity with the, 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 the people across the river. Uh, in fact, three of the Pueblo Indians swimming <laughs> disappeared, and it, it, it got, they got the rumor pretty quick that uh, things weren't going their way. So they decided <laughs> to pull stakes and get out of the country. So Viasur, uh, who was the lieutenant governor of this expedition, he... Um, about sundown, they crossed the river where they had camped three or four days before. Uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Tomas Olguin, who is the Sergeant Major of War, said, why are you stopping? He said, we got enemy on our tail. We can't use our horses here and camp in our lances, which is what a Presidio soldier does. And uh, Villasur turns around, he says, uh, basically, son, that sounds like fear speaking. And Olguin says, sir, I've never known fear. I'm just telling you what appears wise to me. So they go into camp that night. And there's a padre with him, his name's Father Mingus, and he was real busy saying confessions because they could hear dogs barking, they didn't have dogs. They could hear the rustle of water and things moving around them, but they, they sent scouts and couldn't find anything. When dawn came, there was no attack. Usually they'll hitch about three or four o'clock in the morning. By nine o'clock, they brought their horses in and were packing them. People were saying the Ave Maria's, birds were singing. Uh, it, when the, uh, a combination of French and Pawnee attacked. Uh, they had been laying low in the bushes. Uh, they hit everybody. Uh, they, the horses scattered, knocking over uh, campfires. Uh, it was an absolute melee. The Spanish was, were able to do a little counteroffensive. They didn't know what they were up against. And uh, the, the counteroffensive got shot down immediately. And then the Pawnee and Oto crowded over the top of them. What we're going to see in this slight uh, footage uh, I say footage, um, uh, and I skipped the beat, forget me, forgive me. The, the thing about Custer and the 700 images, there was an image done of this painting. The, and, and not only that, but it was apparently done by eyewitness accounts. And so what you're going to see, the whole story unfolds uh, you, for a static image. The whole story is there. And I, what I'm going to do is slowly point it out as we go along. But this battle would be the moment where the Spanish horse met the French gun. And that's why these men were slaughtered. They couldn't sustain. That's the first time the Spanish fought against firearms. All right, we're traveling from the south. This is the Platte River. And what they did, they came across uh, here, and they spent a day and a half. The water was cold. They had a tremendous time. Uh, sand banks, uh, uh, log piles, and that's probably why Viasur didn't d decided to camp. Uh, they, 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 this is about a four-mile area where they should have camped the fatal night. This is the first camp where the, this is C, where they, they would have camped, and they're going to come back to this. This will be the actual battle site. The next day, they heard the drums, so they cross the river. They go down in total force. And they go right, ac they're right across this Linwood site is where this big, huge Pawnee encampment was. It turned bad, so they came back up the rivers with the Indians in pursuit. 
Uh, this is where Thomas O'Gean said uh, we, we should keep moving. It was 4.30, they decided to camp here. There's a reason for it. They had taken their knives and it opened up four or five acres, uh, plus a couple of holes through the bushes to water their horses. So conveniently, there, there was already a pre-camp. What Viasur should have done to allow these guys to limber up in battle is to come out here to the plains, and then he should have set a perimeter guard, but he didn't. Now, I've been actually up here looking for artifacts, being a metal detector guy, I went up to this site asking people if there's any shadow of metal that had been lost, and a uh, few things, but, but for the most part, uh, because this is a floodplain, it didn't exist. Okay, can you hit her for me? Thank you. This is showing the profile. These are the Indians. What the artist was doing here is showing these guys infiltrating during the night. And these are Pawnee carrying their bows and everything else on top of their heads. Uh, and uh, these would be the bushes, and these would the, be the bushes the artist used to conceal the Indians until about 9 o'clock in the morning. The first thing that happens is this is Lieutenant Governor de Viasur. He is shot in the first volley and dropped. Here's his horse that's been down. Now, the artist, to depict the French position with firearms, this is all gun smoke so that people know that both the chaos and that the, the perfidy of the French are involved in this in some manner. This will be the first tent ever seen. This was uh, drawn somewhere after 1720 and 1758 when we know it left Mexico, went to Veracruz, and eventually went up to Switzerland uh, where in the castle where it was found. Okay. All right, now, so we have a line of French here. We've got a front wall firing and a back wall reloading. What we think these guys were, we don't think, we think they were a combination of voyageurs, canoemen, uh, a French militia out of Montreal, and maybe some uh, courier de bois. But they had been, we, we know for a fact that they'd been in this village probably since uh, 1690. They had filial relationships, they had trade relationships. It was convenient for the French because they were on the outskirts of the Great Plains and they could just drop out into the plains and create whatever havoc they needed. The French were traders, they were not colonizers. And that's why they got up, upended uh, in the French-English wars uh, because they had not established, uh, they, they simply wanted to trade and to barter. So we, we have a concerted effort here. These are the Indians, none of the Indians are armed. What the Indians are armed with are French cutlasses. Enough people at, at the first firing by the French grabbed their horses and put a counteroffensive in. And um, the Pawnee and Oto were already coming out seeing men drop. And the Frenchmen stayed in concealment, reload, and then shot categorically maybe 20 guys that were still able to push against the threat. This is one of the gentlemen returning right here. This is one of the Pueblo Indian auxiliaries. He's wearing a pair of Estribo de Cruz. In fact, what I'll do, I'll, I'll just drag some of this stuff over here so you can see it. Okay, this is uh, the cutlass that's shown in many of those pictures. The French are waving them. They're better armed than the Presidio soldiers. Uh, you, you're going to see what we call Estribos, which means stirrup. In Spanish, de Cruz, stirrups of the cross. Now, these were designed... Uh, when you dropped a, a gentleman on the field and he was still viable, though wounded, you could cold cock him on the ground. It gave you control as, as you moved your horse to be able to knock, knock him out with your feet. Pretty serious thing. We got at least this gentleman. You can see all blue, all iron in the painting is blue. You can see his lance. You can see the tomahawk here. Uh, the bow is tipped with iron. And you can see the pair of Estriva de Cruces. I've even studied all the saddle and horse gear. He's wearing what we call a cuera, which is called an armus. It's basically a vest to protect it from the arrows. It did protect from the arrows, but it did not protect from the bullets, and that's why they, they got beaten that day. Um, let's see what else. So we have a little close-up of the French. You, can, you notice the accuracy of the artist, the different toques and uh, different hats, tri-corners. There's three different uh, kinds of hats, and that's what, what's happening here is real interesting. Here's a Frenchman that's been hit by a Spaniard, uh, probably an escopeta ball, and this Pawnee is pausing to drag him off the fire line. 
And the only time that you do that in, in battle is if, if it's your buddy, you know, if you can be of service. This implies a lot more than just the French showing up that day for the fight. We, it implies probably a fairly inter interesting relationship with them. Okay, and you can see just the, the front line of the Spanish who by now in the middle of the battle, those who have survived have gotten into the circle. They're using our dagas, which are rawhide shields. They can shoot from behind them like this. They have a sword, they have pistols, and they have escopetas. The escopeta has to be operated behind the shield. The shield is an old Moorish design, so you can look between the, the humps and still use it to load your, your, your flash pan and then get the gun out to shoot, but it's miserable when you're under that kind of pressure. Okay, let's go to the... Jim, you said that the, uh, um, the soldiers were better armed. What was the others armed with? Well, the, the, the uh, Indians w were oftentimes better armed. Uh, in fact, when we get to the Battle of San Saba, they had, uh, they had, uh, they didn't have firearms, but they had swords, tomahawks, every kind of weapon that was necessary, not in stone, but in iron and the latest technology the French had to lay on them. And normally, uh, the Pueblo Indians would have none of those things. And that's where the Spanish had held sway for so many years, centuries in fact, among the Pueblo Indians, that the threat was minimal and could, could be controlled by a firearm. And, and in this particular deal, they, everything that these, uh, the Pawnee and Oto had uh, were, were far and vastly superior. But that wasn't the threat of the day. The threat of the day was the firearms. Every time 33 men fired into 46 men, somebody fell. And, and uh, even though the battle, the battle still took place over a four hour period and the Spanish maimed uh, the, 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 the French and the Indians to such a degree that the few that did escape, that we found did escape, uh, were not followed. They just left them be. Okay, so, Jeff, yeah. Is there a date on the painting? Do we know what date? Well, th there, therein lies the mystery. The battle came down in 1720. We know it left America in, uh, in 1758. Do we know if it was painted by a French or a Spaniard? No, that, th there, therein lies the intrigue. Uh, we know it was painted we don't know why it was painted, first of all, because it shows the upending of, 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 a, of a Spanish expedition. Uh, number two, um, there are, we, we know the, the, the paintings are kind of a hybrid drawing between the flat schematic planes pictures that you see are real flat and, 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 and a, a, some type of cartoonish. In other words, they're more three-dimensional. When Catlin was painting, Indians looking over his shoulders within months were changing their pictographs uh, into a more of a, a three-dimensional using perspective. In the painting yourself, the, the lower ones will be smaller and the, and the, high, the back ones will be higher, indicating a, a frame of perspective. Uh, 